I think when it comes to design, and this goes for both professional and student submissions, um, there's, there's design more in the capital D of like, here's like a hardware product. And then like, and then when it comes to impact, as we all have discussed here, like impact isn't, it's a very holistic process that needs to consider multiple stakeholders, the ecosystem, how things would get implemented. And the, I think the tear totter between like, here's like a design or a product and how much that includes that entire holistic thinking and testing and the plurality of, of the communities and users that will be involved in it was something that I really look for rather than just like, here's a product that would be really usable for this particular <laughs> um, uh, question or issue. I think with the professional entries, uh, at first I was like, oh, will this become more of a, of a branding thing? But it was also nice to see that there were a number of organizations that it wasn't just about, you know, product branding or, or marketing. ReliefWatch is an independent platform that allows recipients of aid around the world to provide their feedback on humanitarian assistance in their areas. It's for camps and neighborhoods where humanitarian organizations are acting. I think ReliefWatch stood out to me uh, because it was so grounded in also having um, the community involved and testing the uh, proposed interventions, monitoring evaluation. There's often a lot of metrics that we impose on like the impact of an international project without really understanding or being able to have a way to get feedback from um, the communities that we're working with. The Leaf Watch I really like. It's kind of like it's um, accessible for, for the real user. And I think that's so much of this problem in every country that have this kind of problem of migrations and people understanding each other. Anything that systematizes uh, a way for them to communicate and really get action going on their needs, um, I, I think is, a, is really wonderful and it helps a population that people don't do enough innovation or design around in my view. So I really, really appreciated Relief Watch. Simple stood out to me. Simple is really like a digital health platform, which I think in the future that the health system, and even right now, like if you have an app to kind of like detect the pandemics and many other things, I think that would be another good way of develop this kind of application for the public health for people to get access to equality in terms of the health issue, which I think is being a really concern right now as we actually dwell in pandemic. Another one that I really appreciated was the increase in kidney transplant. Um, I happen to know some people who struggled with uh, issues around kidneys not functioning uh, and how difficult it was. And I thought that this was actually a very clever uh, deep dive. I, I read through it very carefully and I saw that they put a lot of effort into understanding what the issues are uh, at, at a systemic level and coming up with a solution and a scoring system that actually tries to address it. And the design was all sort of uh, secondary after a deep listening exercise, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and it is a big issue. But, but exactly as, as Koch is also saying, it's such a systemic problem. I've never seen like someone think at that level. And, and I wanted to, I just wanted to note that. And I wanted to be like, yeah, this person, they're thinking in a, in a really important way. And they are, they did, they did a lot of hard work in terms of researching the issues and talking to the doctors. Yeah. Finally, another project that I wanted to note is the juvenile justice map. You know, the prison industrial complex is something I think about frequently, and uh, the system is totally problematic, and it's also opaque. Well, even if we go as young as children in the school to confinement pipeline, right? Like this is a major issue, uh, and at Creative Reaction Lab, we directly have a program working with formerly incarcerated and criminal justice system impacted youth of color. I think it could have been um, easier to understand. I guess to me, I, I feel like it, with it being juvenile justice map, it still, in my opinion, was created as if it was targeting an audience of adults versus actually working, like thinking through the lens of, yes, you have the parents and you have the stakeholders and you have essentially the sphere of influence that, um, and you know that are influencing youth 
But at the same time, uh, many times when a lot of these pieces are created, they're not actually bringing in youth voice. Uh, it was nice for me to see something that, while I felt, of course, is not doing enough to address some of the root causes and root issues, at least is bringing some clarity uh, to how the system works for people that are on the receiving end of it, which uh, the dynamics of which are so powerful. You know, it's, I think it's one of the reasons why we're, we're marching these days. I thought Escaping a Strange Loop stood out as like a pretty innovative project in that it's a very speculative project, but it does play into this role-playing, it uses role-playing scenarios to help leaders or individuals imagine a future. So I was like, oh, like that could be interesting in terms of playing out scenarios. Um, and yeah, that was the same thought I had as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. Because I actually think that was a really strong, I was like, yes, we need to have this uh, future projecting and then like us testing. Escaping the strange loop, um, you know, so I love speculative design and speculative fiction. Um, you know, where I work at the United Nations, we're, uh, we're coming up on 75 years of the UN's existence. So this is a major inflection point for us in terms of reflecting on the past and reflecting on the future. And we ourselves are doing a lot of work around speculative design, speculative fiction, and what's called backcasting, where we think about desirable and undesirable futures and then we backcast on the basis of a desirable future and think about what are the different turns that we need to take in order to uh, arrive at that desirable future. And to do that at such a grand scale, thinking about energy, where we get our energy from, uh, given also the knowledge I, and experience I have well, that's strategically of interest to different empires. Uh, these are all things that I care about deeply and I thought that Escaping the Strange Loop was, was kind of addressing those questions in a clever and playful and gamified way. I did select the purpose engine because I saw that it also was addressing a major systemic issue that uh, is huge in the United States of the lack of racial diversity, um, inclusive practice, practices and equitable practices in the education space. Um, particularly when you think about um, the percentage of breakdown of youth receiving education and and how a majority of the educators are white, and particularly white women. Uh, and that's why you see so many funds that are coming out now to try to increase diversity uh, within the world and within this field. Um, and the fact that they put a gamification approach, I think they could have been stronger in grading, um, creating an alignment between, okay, here's how these four uh, like profiles will help directly uh, address uh, the pipeline challenge. They talked about the lack of racial diversity. They had, I think, a very compelling and I think a, a kind of gamified approach. I don't think the line between like the 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 reason and the problem and the output and the intervention was as strong. The thing that I'll say just to in terms of notables uh, is that I I appreciated also the ethical stack. I think that too often we don't think about how the platforms we use encourage certain behaviors and discourage other behaviors and actually guide how we think. And they literally shape our neuronal pathways. And something that focuses on how technology gets built and asks ethical questions about how technology gets built and gets developers and makers to uh, ask themselves those uh, questions and think about the consequences of their design uh, at a systemic level, I think is really smart. 30 minutes. Thank you, Kaj. I know it's so late over there. Um, let's move on to uh, student entries, which there are so many of. I think with the student entries, um, I recognize um, the limitations of you're in school. You don't necessarily have like the experience or ability to pilot this, nor do you really have as much of the real world lived experience of implementation. Um, I think with that said, I do appreciate the um, imaginative, imaginativeness that does come from some of the um, ideas. Um, I think I saw several categories or broad strokes around the student entries, um, a lot around circular sustainability, um, so sustainable products, and, and there's very much sort of a orientation towards um, much more from the student entries and the professional entries on, on the environment. Um, and also, like Danish said, I really appreciated the entries that had very deep listening. There was very thoughtful design research um, 
and it was not necessarily as product oriented, but I think that in itself as a process is such a huge part of design. Um, and I think another category that I saw was just around um, the connection between uh, youth and adults. Um, and I think that also comes from lived experience of them potentially just having left home or still living at home. Um, and I thought that was also a, uh, a, an angle that probably comes more from, uh, uh, from a student perspective as well. It was my favorite. I don't know why. Yeah, I would say out of all of them, Cheer Project was Project was my top. Okay. Cheer Project also stood out to me because it was really thoughtful in using a sustainable resource that doesn't just. Uh, I believe it was yeah, it was grounded in in the Indian context, but it could also be used for um, uh, like California forest fires, and then thinking about how that could be used as a material. Uh, for other product design. Getting this um, fire from the forest, which I think has become even more normal, like from in Australia, in my country, and in California, like how can we really cope with all those things? I thought that it was pretty holistic in every, every in all aspects of it too. Fresh water free fabrics. Um, mm -hmm. The very simple, their solution was delivered very simple and elegantly, but. The fresh water, I just feel that is, will be another challenging in the future that the fresh water will become such a hard um, issue to, to have and actually find that to go to the industry clothing. It's kind of like, fixing the two problem with one product. It does tackle this larger question and I can see it um, just like with Reed Studio, we work with uh, the fashion sector and we work a lot with circular economy um, questions and what they've designed, I feel like it can plug in pretty simply into that and then and it also answers the kind of a set of questions that the fashion company cares about as well. So it's, it's pretty thoughtful in terms of it having an impact within the circular economy supply chain for fashion. One is magnetic tiles. Uh, it's related to the impair user to communicate better when they're crossing the road. I thought it was, um, it was very community centered. It, it, it is addressing um, major issues uh, within the visually impaired community or the community of people that are visually impaired. Um, and I, I, I thought I appreciated the, the real connection to humans again, like I, it was the same thing I said in professional, you, you saw them testing it, you saw them engaging them, you saw them as part of the process. There was a very, there was a very strong product development around, um, what they're building, but the, the user testing was impressive. Um, I also really thought it was pretty imaginative to connect using magnetism as a way to connect with the product. Um, and there was a lot of thought process around scale and the user as well. I think that it had a really good combination of both product and also testing and serving the end user um, quite well. Um, I will be honest, like the ancillary, like bed sores one is more personal for me. My grandmother um, had a mild stroke last year and um, which has limited her ability to move and now it's to the point well she can move but not as much but now it's to the point where she can't even sleep in her bed because it's uncomfortable and so she's always in the chair uh and always in the, a similar chair to what was shown with ancillary bed sores for um older folks or people that have different ability status um that are you know differently abled it is a major concern uh, of you not really having movability, but then also at the same time uh, having a high risk of bed sores, which creates more more harm and pain. And so to see a project that was directly looking at addressing that, um, to me, it was a simple product design, but in my opinion, a needed product design. Um, fallback also stood out to me as well. Um, I think the problem is really, really important. I work in peace and security. And so I think about that a lot, um, and it's been affecting um, a number of conflicts that I'm working on. 
Um, so anything that uh, addresses that issue of global internet shutdowns and, and you know, is, is, is really important to me. Uh, the larger question was more around implementation. Um, something like that is, you know, requires a lot of, a lot of systems design, um, but very, very important in terms of all of the rise of authoritarian governments and internet shutdowns um, and doing work in China uh, and knowing that, that that's not just an issue in China, um, this is something that I think will be inc increasingly relevant as an intervention. Um, I am very drawn to also anything with coral reefs because it's, it's you know, one of the largest ecosystem wipeouts that we're experiencing right now. Nemo coral stood out to me just because they've done a lot of research um, and the intervention is hardware focused. So I think it depends a lot on testing and execution and things like that will take a while to roll out. Um, but I still commend them for just pursuing the research thought process and figuring around an intervention. WeCat also stood out to me. I thought that it was one of the most like thoughtful um, interventions uh, in the circular economy category. And it was really thought out in terms of the, the material, who are the producers, and the end product was really cute. <laughs> and it was very, it was like a very, very uh, direct product for a very direct market that doesn't exist. So I think it, it stood out to me in, in, in all the aspects of both research, um, the people that it would touch on and having like an outstanding product that could potentially sell. The whole process kind of fully answer like where it's come from, how the material has been made and is actually go back to the community. The, the cat I know can seem pretty whimsical, like the shape and design, but I also think that's the type of thing that's sort of, because if their objective is consumer sales to make income for the artisans, so for at Root Studio, like our whole thing is around uh, being able to create sustainable income um, in innovative ways uh, into newer markets. And I do think the novelness of how interesting a product is has a lot to do with pushing sales. And so when I saw that form factor, it seems like they probably thought through like who the end user is, which is like a cat purchaser. It may seem a little divorced from these larger issues, but I do think that it, it's really elegantly designed in that way. Um, so that's why it, it sort of stood out to me because it, it touches on all sides of that. Um, even though I'm anti-brand, I will say that Shine LA stood out for me. Um, I saw a lot of behavioral change um, components, even with the bench and uh, having like the placement of hands and having the marks of the placement of feet and how you can use the bench to not only sit and converse, but also exercise and having this movement component. Uh, and when you watch the video, seeing these different kind of journeys and, and touch points um, of how you can get someone at, you know, a basic level and then you might lose them, but then if they... Mm -hmm dive deeper, um, they are able to, in a sense, also have this behavioral change across their family. I thought was interesting. I think Tire Collective is a good contender because it is also another circular economy project that's really well researched and well, really well thought out as well. I think it's such a big problem. I used to went to these Michelin um, talks and the we kind of wonder why it's all those little particles of the tires go. This actually goes into the environment to be breathing in. So having this is kind of collect all this trash that when we drive. I think it's such a it's such an issue that we all drive and where does the tide goes to pollute the environment. I, I feel like survive was it thought of, it, it again thought about the different and did research on the journey of like uh, individuals that are farmers that uh, commit. Uh, suicide um, and they have they're being um, not accepted at different hospitals and so it's a higher risk of dying then and then when they get finally get to a place that accept them it takes 30 minutes to go through the process I thought it was very smart the way it thought about uh, addressing such a major issue I thought the tech development was interesting the community engagement was interesting the social problem it's trying to solve is uh, farmers committing suicides in India. This is a really widespread problem uh, because they're the hardest hit. And now with the the basically the disaster of COVID-19, uh, they're they're going to be hit even harder. Basically, they end up in a lot of debt, and because they can't deal with the debt they're in, they commit suicide. And this is like sort of uh, like epidemic level proportions, unfortunately, in parts of India. And often the the choice way of killing oneself is taking poison. So basically. This is a device that's deployable in rural settings that helps address that. 
and I thought that was interesting. I liked your identity because a lot of the IDPs and uh, not just IDPs, but refugees, I should say, that I've come across are people that are extremely qualified. They're doctors, they're physicists, they're scientists, they're, you know, uh, mathematicians, they're interpreters, but they just don't have a system for uh, translating their qualifications through some kind of equivalence platform into uh, the context that they're working in. So you might have someone from Syria who moves to Denmark, who's a nuclear physicist or something really specialized, who then just becomes someone who's working a blue collar job, right? And, and you also have situations where you have doctors who are refugees coming into countries where there's a shortage of medical pro uh, personnel, uh, medical professionals. So I thought this was a clever way of addressing the issue of jobs and job security and even host communities really taking advantage of the qualifications that refugees bring. The last thing I would I will add and kind of just harp on what we we discussed, um, really making sure that when we talk about social impact that we're thinking about process, we're thinking about actual impact and not intention, and that community themselves are actually a part of the process and in many ways the co-creators, I think is um, really important whether it's a student starting up or it's a professional that um, is deeper in their career, it is something that should be considered. And knowing that visual beauty does not equal social impact, but usability um, and, and addressing root causes is what usually hits social impact. For sure, I, I, I would also agree very much with that sentiment that as designers, our role isn't to just make something that's visually beautiful that agrees with our vision in our head of what something should be, but it's so much about listening, observing, taking that, and as designers, translating that into something that's effective, and then taking that and testing it and making sure it's actually grounded and contextual. Um, and that's, I think, where our creativity can come in as designers, um, rather than dominate a, a, a narrative or a vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm actually really impressed by how even um, both prof professional and students kind of like think through like even the process, the material, and then the outcome. And I just feel that as a designer, how could you link that three components or four or five components and actually create the real impact that, that achieve your goal? And all the steps have to be synchronized as a clear objective.